Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. Now, this week, I'm joined by Christopher Such and Dr. Robert Sharples for an exploration of English as an additional language and all that that entails. Now, I'm not going to spend much time introducing this episode because I know you will have listened to last week's and you'll be ready and ready to go. So without further ado, let's get straight back into it. Are there any common misconceptions you encounter in the profession about pupils who speak English as an additional language? So it's important to note, because everything we've talked about, these misconceptions are coming from a good place. But but in the absence of knowledge, you can you can get to a strange place quite quickly. So the 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 most common and possibly the most damaging one you hear is asking parents to speak English at home. And you think, how how could I how could I do that? How could I parent my kids in another language I don't really speak? I mean it it's sort of ludicrous to imagine that I could. My daughter is five and she negotiates with me like she's trying to get hostages out of me. Like the thought of being able to do that in another language, it, it, I couldn't. So why? Well, we know that children need a lot of exposure to language and, and it, it makes intuitive sense that that um, that we should speak English as much as possible to maximise exposure. But there's other things to know as well. And in this particular case, um, and this is actually one of the reasons I've been coming back to, to the, that work on multilingual perspectives and translanguaging, is that whether or not languages are stored separately in the brain, they transfer really, really well. So the most effective thing that parents could do is to speak to children in their strongest language or whatever language is right for their family. If parents speak different languages and they want to speak those different languages, the kids exposed to two languages at home plus one at school, do it. For everything that we've said, that's where the language is the most meaningful, the richest and so on. And actually, as your language proficiency develops, and especially early primary, all children are developing their language proficiency. The grammatical system is largely in place before they start school, but their their range of language, their ability to use it, the concepts that go with it are all developing. So you get that really, really great language model from the people who care for you at home and for your teachers at school. And that really helps develop that language capacity. And then, of course, as, as time goes by, you know, it transfers really well. Being able to do things with one language means you're able to do things with language in general. The same goes for literacy, actually. You know, you might you might see some measures of language development and literacy development um, coming a bit slower in bilingual children. But that's entirely logical. So, you know, first words you learn is from zero to one. Infinite percentage increase. Next one from one to two, from two to four, four to eight. It's doubling each time. Fantastic. If that's split across two languages, I mean, you know, very simplifying things here, and you measure one of those languages, English, well, that kid's going to seem to have a smaller vocabulary. But there's no upper limit to what your vocabulary is. And very quickly, as they move through through schooling and, and probably by this point into secondary, that upper limit is is not that meaningful to us. So kids, kids have such a big uh, repertoire of language that we would say that they're just you know successfully bilingual so using your strongest language at home and doing all the things that you do to develop children's language and literacy in whatever language is right for them is great now you can make that more effective in the school if you can support both languages and people would often ask well okay if i'm going to encourage parents to to speak to their children in their first language and um read to them and and you know take them to the local museum all the, all these things that that give you rich opportunities for talk if I'm going to do all that in home language how do I connect it to school because I don't speak those languages so I can't really engage with that and, and I don't have any oversight of it something that secondary teachers incidentally often say is um, um I can't have children speaking other languages in school because there might be bullying you know you got to you got to chuckle a little bit right because I've never met a teacher who couldn't spot bullying at 100 paces and if it's not happening in front of you you wouldn't know anyway which regardless of which language it is so so trust yourself, really, I think. Having children use other languages in the classroom, you you might not know what they're saying, but I'm pretty confident you can spot if they're on task or not or what the relationships are and so on. You know, these are your skills. You can do this. So 
having some bilingual books in the class is really powerful because that's just a that big signal is welcome asking children to read to you um when that's the right age for that in other languages is incredibly powerful you might not you might not know what they're saying but it's still really powerful because they're the ones doing the reading even if you can't give them the same level of feedback that you might do otherwise it's still really powerful if you think of a kind of a sequence of activities that you put together to make a a, a lesson class um we often think that to develop really high levels of english it's all got to be in english and that, that you know that's another misconception that's linked to to home language if we think about it if we recognize that high level skills in both languages are going to support each other you might be able to do a bit of scaffolding and that is to say that if you're getting some of the children in your class to to talk about something and the classic example um is is from an early secondary uh, might be late primary where they've got a sheet of paper with iron filings on top and a magnet underneath and they're moving around the kids are talking about this and of course the language is completely meaningless when it's written down in a in a book or a paper right? oh no what's that doing there i'll shift that oh that's oh look that's doing that it's so embedded in that context now there's no reason why children couldn't use all their languages to do that i won't subject you to my bad french but <laughs> It's clear from the context what they're doing, what they're pointing to, what they're talking about. So from there, we might think about how they would begin to make notes on that, how they would begin to record it, how they'd speak back to the teacher or the class if they're asked to talk about what they found. So you can see that you might get, perhaps from being very free about use of different languages, you might encourage children to, to add some notes or have a practice where they can use both languages or, or they could ask a, a, a classmate who shares the same first language if they have one but to really try to get it into English. And when they write it up in their books, that they might have to do really in English. At an earlier stage, you might say, oh, you can even you know, give two color pens if you want, use your other color if you need to write a word in just to keep the writing going. And then we can go back over that and say, okay, so what, right, let's learn the English word for that because you've got a gap there, you know you need one. Using children's different languages in the classroom when you don't speak that language is, that language is entirely feasible. But if you think about how the child is developing knowledge and skill through what you're doing across a period of time, whether that's half an hour, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year. You, you don't need everything to be in high quality English. You just need to get to high quality English. And the getting there, allowing them to use everything they know to support what they're doing is going to be really, really powerful. So without, without kind of delving into too much of the details, common misconception is they need only English. And actually at home, in class, there's loads of opportunities for you them to use all their languages and there's good reasons for doing it I, i'd love to pause there though because i know when we were chatting before you've come across loads of misconceptions as well and i wondered if i could ask what you've come across i don't really know whether this is a misconception but it's something that i've heard time and time again from teachers who have worked with quite a lot of um, pupils who are new to english and it mirrors some of my experiences which are that there's this idea that generally quite often pupils who are new to English fall into kind of one of two um, kind of camps. And on one side of things, you have pupils who are almost almost silent for a long time. Mm -hmm. So they're building up their language capabilities, but they don't have the confidence to use it. And, you know, that kind of mirrors what you were talking about earlier about the difference sometimes between that capability and confidence. And then there's a kind of second kind of pupil who from the very beginning are happy or happier to experiment with the new kind of nascent bits of mm -hmm. English that they are developing. And the, whether it's a misconception or not, it tends to be around for those pupils, from my experience, those pupils who are the kind of in the first camp, it tends to be around the six month mark where almost suddenly there's a, oh, wow. It, it look, feels like an explosion of language and what it really is or what it feels like at least is more like an explosion of confidence so they've been building up this quietly building up this language capability and then suddenly you've almost from nowhere you feel like you've got sentences etc so I don't know whether this mirrors kind of conversations you've had with teachers or whether it's completely silly to suggest that perhaps no there it's, it's called the silent period it's it's really well really well attested and you're absolutely on the money and everything you've said so what's happening when kids are silent they are not disengaged they are not lost they might be a bit lost 
but they, they are they are really paying attention they're attending to what's happening around them in their language so if children arrive in a classroom they don't speak the language it is overwhelming at first part of what they're doing is just working out you know <laughs> who's who what's what how do things work around here but their brains are, are really attending to the language and that's why it's so important even in that silent period to keep including them even if it's even if you're not requiring a response oh yeah that happened on on your table didn't it chris like that just means that the, the language is still direct and they're still part of it underneath the bonnet as it were that that pattern spotting machine in the brain that is the brain is just working really really hard trying to sort through triage find patterns in the language i guess you you could talk about it as, as this sudden explosion where, where sentences come out but another way to think about it is it all this furious activity suddenly reaches escape velocity if you like and partly it's still with confidence not everyone is is going to kind of launch at the same time but those engines have been straining for quite a while at least six weeks so anything that happens in the first six weeks of a new pupil arrive in the school chalk it up to experience there's not much point doing a lot of language testing in the first six weeks um, because that most children just w won't give you a true picture of their abilities so early on. And that's why we say, you know, place them high, sit them next to, to strong peers so they get that model, um, make sure they've got some buddies, do all the things that are going to just set them place. Don't worry too much about um, checking they've learned things. I mean, I'm not saying ignore them in the corner. But just recognize there's only so much that they can process at, any, at one given moment. There's a lot going on. And if you take from that six weeks up to six months or a year, a secure foundation means they're going to do amazingly across all that time. A wobbly foundation means that it's going to take so long for them to, to settle and then get secure. So six weeks to six months is, is a realistic range. There is absolutely no need to worry about language delay or, or any kind of impairment or send in that time if, if a child isn't talking. It's absolutely normal. And if I'm honest, that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly how I would feel, to be honest. After that period, got some buddies and, and you're including the classroom, um, you might look at ways to to give them opportunities to speak. And, and that might be, you know, a, a think pair share which might, might be quite simple with, with a, a class bit sitting next to them. It might be in a small group taken out by the TA to do some, some preparatory work. Everyone is is so different. So often you'll find it's in those smaller settings when, when you'll begin to notice it. Sometimes it just comes out in a flood. There you go. Uh, isn't, isn't life wonderful? Um, but I think just knowing that, that, yeah, really six months is a totally reasonable period of time. You would know, though, as, as you got sort of between six weeks and six months when that child is is really isolated and it's all the all the warning signs that you would look for with your sort of safeguarding hat on so if a child appears really withdrawn i'd be concerned if a child appears to be really isolated i'd be concerned but if a child is is looking like their brain is working over time and is is you know they might not be talking very much they're they're classmates that they're sitting with because they are working at full tilt just keeping up with things so that that one is absolutely the silent period is really really worth knowing about i guess the one of the misconception or perhaps misconception uh, and again in this one like the last might not be um that i've kind of come across are claims around and often they seem quite outlandish perhaps claims about the incredible long-term um advantages that a pupil yeah. has academically if they speak uh, if they're bilingual or if they're multilingual now it goes without saying that there are you know being able to speak multi multiple languages is itself you know and uh, like a, a hugely valuable capability but i wonder what the research perhaps suggests um and whether there is maybe yeah. a more nuanced picture about the, yeah. the, the values of it to <laughs> say mathematics or learning yeah. history or whatever it might be yeah it's a really complex picture and as far as academic stuff goes can be pretty controversial now, academic twitter is um is is not like teacher twitter right 
it's, it's a lot more sedate <laughs> but still um okay so the, the one of the main areas in, in which this bi bilingual advantage as it's called is, is described um is with something called executive function and it's the idea that having two languages on the go at the brain they're always being activated so if if, if you um if you speak french and i show you a picture of a pen your brain's going to activate the word stilo and the word pen at the same time and um subconsciously you will suppress one of those so if you're speaking english you'll sort of not let the french come up and the english will come up and um, and below the level of your consciousness you are you are constantly um uh, exerting what's called an executive function to manage everything that's happening in the brain executive function is is implicated in a, a wide range of really beneficial things um and so the thinking goes that because bilinguals are constantly exercising that that executive function it's going to have effects elsewhere where that that is used um that's one aspect of it there, there's lots of ways uh, that we can also think about bilingualism it, it's meant to have for various other mechanisms a, a protective effect against neurodegenerative diseases um it's meant to make your uh teeth whiter um it's meant to make you kind of a better cook i don't know the, the claims do get a bit <laughs> the claims do get a bit outlandish but but fundamentally there's a couple of ideas one is social that that it makes you better able to understand the world and people in it one is is that things like executive function mean that you are better equipped for other uh, yeah all kinds of other benefits so this is not directly my area of um research and i will um hereby <laughs> uh, annoy at least everyone but for me the, the evidence is not yet settled enough to use uh, as the basis for for professional professional judgment in teaching and and I, I think it's really it's really important when when we are academics talking with teachers that we talk about the strength of evidence as well as how interesting it is there is some evidence that seems to be really strong no reasonably strong and and this is um associated work with work of thomas back in edinburgh and and um dina memegovic in london um with what they call the healthy linguistic diet and, and they've got a website if you google that term that um, learning languages all through life seems to have a protective effect in in later life um as they think that you know eating a healthy diet is good diet is good for you in old age a healthy linguistic diet similarly and and that that may well be so we we don't know necessarily whether that's specific to a language or just because it's generally exercising your brain is good really controversial uh, lots of really exciting research has been happening over the years for schools what does it tell us well for starters there's huge variation between individuals so with the people sitting in front of you i don't think there's much that you would change about what you do on the basis of that except i'd say to have a generally positive view of bilingualism so we know that bilingualism is a good thing it might not live up to some of its stronger claims and what we find in the research now is is the claims are getting um, a bit attenuated they're getting more specific so some things will help in some areas others will help in other areas rather than these big broad claims that that bilingualism is just amazing for everything that's a, that's a bit unfair generalizing a little but it, it, it's not something that i think i think should change what you do day to day there is there is some really good research though that looks at attainment at um key stage one key stage two key stage three key stage four so I guess people outside outside England um school leaves exams at 16 all the way down to, to early primary that shows that consistently bilingual children with a high level of proficiency will outperform their monolingual peers so um we we tend to use the the five stage um model of proficiency that, that comes from the work of Hilary Hester before but um, the DfE used it and the Bell Foundation use it in their assessment frameworks. It's become very established. So A is new to English and E is um, very, very fluent. So C is a kind of a good intermediate level. And what we see for primary is that children who arrive at stage A, new to English, 
or newish because certainly if they've grown up in this country they would have been exposed to English even if they speak another language in the home but stage A basically new to English we would expect them to achieve solid stage C by the time they leave primary a smaller percentage will achieve stage D um, some will not achieve stage C and then that would be a worry and, and then they'll go on and make the rest of the progress through uh, early secondary and by about year nine you know they, they, sh they should be really really strong the well there's two things to notice about that number one is that stages d and e are quite difficult to distinguish it's easier to identify a child who's completely new to english than to distinguish between the very highest levels of proficiency so because that kind of assessment is a specialist job but it's not a specialism that that is the same as teaching we're not very good at distinguishing d and e so i'd sort of take d plus as our most meaningful category the other is that if we look you know at sort of bar charts that show um, on the, the vertical axis how well children do in an examination and on the horizontal axis you've got a b c d e i have to, have to apologize to everyone i had COVID a few weeks ago and you can probably tell my voice isn't holding up the way it used to so i keep uh, chomping down my words i'm sorry if that's irritating to listen to um if you if you look at those charts then what you see is that at stage a people pupils tend to do very poorly in examinations and you think well yeah <laughs> obviously <laughs> try give me an exam in chinese i wouldn't do very well at all stage b they do a bit better stage c consistently now we've looked at, at um teacher assessed and externally assessed um, um assessments um they've uh, looked at english as well as a range of other um subjects and it's really consistent so it's not like this applies in some places but not others it's a really consistent finding at stage c you're in spitting distance of the national average often inside the margin of error so at stage c crucially that's where we expect children to get to by the end of primary you're you're able to access the curriculum pretty well and then you can make the the rest of the progress quite quickly so that gives us a pretty good recommendation beyond the concept of bilingual advantage we know it's a pretty good thing we know that children will, will actually do better um most likely on average on um assessments when they have a high level of proficiency but there's a clear job here and i think a realistic goal for primary teachers with children who are new to english get them to, to that good intermediate level by the time they leave primary and you know you've set them up they can access the secondary curriculum pretty well and they'll continue to make that progress so what that does then is it is it pulls us down from bilingual advantage to by and large in secondary right now we've got our strategies for what to do focus on security for new arrivals um make sure we've got good language proficiency data think about how we might adapt that that offer for different pupils um we know we've got to get them up to a certain stage and if we do that we set them up well for what comes next and if we can go further than that fantastic you know you begin to get the shape of primary eal in a way that you couldn't without that robust data can i ask a really quick question off the back of that mm -hmm. you talk about um and mentioned a great deal earlier the um, importance of recognizing pupils um english proficiency mm -hmm. um and how that is a key determinant of you know their level of academic attainment at that point etc how formally or informally should a school go about this because presumably you can that you can you know perhaps in certain circumstances find out from parents or you can have conversations with the child and get a kind of a sense of where a pupil might be at but that presumably only takes you so far you mentioned kind of assessment materials from mm. bell foundation are these things that are um, accessible to say a teacher or a senko or are these things that should only be ever kind of used by a trained professional very good question well th these are consequential decisions so let's put it this way give us a thousand pounds chris uh i'm gonna kind of glance at the front cover of the financial times and then i'm going to decide where i'm going to invest your money for you um you know <laughs> we wouldn't make consequential decisions without without really thinking through it y you need to know so uh, you, you can't if you don't know where a pupil is starting from how can you base good decisions professionally on it you, you just you gotta know and without it, you're flying blind so how can we find it out you absolutely be systematic about it so the bell foundation is my go-to recommendation and if you just google bell foundation el assessment framework 
um, you you have to register on their website, but you can download it for free. It was um, put together by uh, a group of uh, really well-regarded academics. Um, so it, it is robust in what it does. And it, it has it's got a primary version and a secondary version. It comes with guidelines for using it. And essentially it gives you gives this page and it's got different skills. So speaking, uh, listening, reading and viewing, writing, um, and a series of statements, 10 statements. So you can imagine the 10 columns and each one has a little bit in it. Can they do this? And you just take a highlighter and it gives you a best fit. And that will give you an overall picture. Now, it's got a couple of problems is probably a bit strong. A couple of features to know about. So number one is people do often find it uh, a bit slow to use. I, I think it gets quicker um, as you use it. But the feedback I get from people is it, it can be a bit weighty. Um, and it often gives you know a bit more information than people are really prepared to use. And I... I recognize that, but I, I suspect the developers um, wanted to give really high quality uh, data and maybe, you know, that that's overkill for where some schools are at the moment. But, but I think it's, it, it, it's not, it's not a wrong decision. It's just a decision they have to make. Do we do something that's a bit more comprehensive or not? Um, the other one is that it's teacher assessed. So I was, I was talking to one, nameless ed tech platform who have got an online assessment you can use and and they were telling me oh yeah well of course it includes a function where the teacher can change the grade if necessary and i nearly dropped my lukewarm coffee <laughs> what's the point of an assessment if you can just go in and change it then um you know so so having an assessment that directly tests children's language will give you really good insight but it, it basically means sticking a kid in front of an ipad for a while and and that's not always what we want to do the assessment framework that Bell have designed is for teachers to, to observe children and, and to write down what they can do. So it's based on these can do statements. And, and that's got a kind of a long history in the language assessment field. So you get a bit, bit of variation perhaps between teachers. But basically, I think that is the best one. There's another one by NASSEA, N-A-S-S-E-A, -S -S -E um, based in the north of England. And then there's an American one called WIDA. Um, W-I-D-A. It's more commonly used in American schools and in a lot of international schools. It, it, it's similar in many ways to the, the Bell Foundation one. So I just I just start you just start using it. Um, it takes a bit of practice at first, I suppose, but it comes with guidance materials and, and that's going to give you that really good data. It's not the um, only thing you can do. So um, a really good questionnaire on arrival. What languages are spoken at home? Who do you speak those languages to? And just know that, that in a lot of cultures, they're going to give you information that you or I might say isn't quite accurate, but we kind of need to check our own cultural assumptions a little bit. So we come from a country where for most people, um, we are taught good English in school. So a, a particular form of literacy and language use there, there is one spoken and one written variety. There's, there's some regional variation, but there's basically English in this country is English. Now, in a lot of parts of the world that are just fundamentally multilingual, that just doesn't quite make sense. So parents will often tell you the most prestigious language variety that they use. The Hindi, for example, it's a big kind of lingua franca. It's used um, all, all over um, parts of South Asia. And that's the language you would use if you're speaking to certain institutions or authority figures, perhaps. It's not the language um, the family would use at home, but it's the language that if they were asked, do you speak? They'd, they'd, they'd say, yes, we do. So when our school says, what language do you speak? And they say a language like Hindi. And actually, then you find out later the kid doesn't speak Hindi at home. That's because we're, we're just coming from very, very different places around the way languages are used in our communities. So a bit of a bit of exploring who what languages do you use and with whom for example is going to give you that richer insight um otherwise you pair them up with a first language buddy with two languages they barely know and you know you can get into trouble so that's just ways that you can get that bit more insight into, into what's happening but just also you know keep adding to it you'll learn so much as of with every child as you teach them and and if you can add that that's that's great the one the one caveat that i'd say is that um, that kind of data is only useful if it's used and data that's meticulously collected then stuck on a google drive or a one drive and never seen again it isn't that helpful so something we're doing at, at my university is we're working on a minute as a set of tools 
that will turn those uh, assessment results and we're, we're, we'll build a, an assessment for it and um, we'll turn them into teaching recommendations for that child so we we're building a system that can integrate all these various things that you know and we're hoping to put together a simple web platform for example so that you can get to that usable information really really quickly and and just cut out a lot of that variation so you know watch this space uh, and we we hope um to come back at some point and tell you how that's going but just recognizing that data that sits in the cupboard is useless so so using that to to inform how you you build out your practice is is hard and it, you know it it is not this is not a straightforward thing to do it, you know really is about kind of deepening your knowledge working out what you're going to base your professional judgments on i know i know we've talked about about various things we've written chris i've tried to set that up in a book but also like i spend quite a lot of time just working with schools and particular groups of schools to just work through okay how do we put this in place how does it work so if someone wants to have a deeper conversation about how it might work in their school they're very welcome just to get in touch and i'd be happy to talk it through in a bit of more of a specific way you've worked on projects specifically relating to migrant learners and refugees and school leadership what would you want every teacher and school leader to know about how best to support these pupils if you've got your fundamentals straight for these pupils, then then you're doing the right thing. And, and Chris mentioned that feeling of, and, and you've mentioned Kieran, of, of not knowing quite what to do and, and all the emotions that brings up. And I think particularly when we have children who have experienced trauma, it, we're human beings. That That's often all we can see. These children are here because their parents wanted a better life for them. And we're, we're not doing them justice if we if we don't offer that supportive stretching curriculum. So let's not be blinded by the lights. We, we also, we talk about migrant and refugee peoples. I know I do, but they're not actually particularly meaningful terms because, you know, without dwelling on the, the many different types of legal status these children can have, they're children. So they're not, you know, they're not getting deported anytime. And while they're here, they, they have a, a statutory right to an education, same as every child does. So. I think for migrant and refugee children of primary age, then then making sure you've got those fundamentals right is really, really important. As they get into secondary age, especially as they get closer to 16, 18, the legal stuff becomes um, uh, more significant. And also you, you tend to get children who have migrated unaccompanied in, in mid-secondary. And of course, that's not something we, we see in, in primary age. So again, those fundamentals straight, um, making sure that they... They have just a, a welcoming environment where they're known, where they feel secure, where they um, are able to make some friends, where their teachers include them, where the teachers know that supporting all their languages is really, really important. That's that's the the best start for everybody. And Mike, if, if you'll let me just talk about some of the things we've done outside schools. We've just done this this project focusing on, on one city here in Bristol, where I am, looking at um, actually, the professionals who work with with young migrants and refugees, and although I think a lot of these pupils were older than primary age, I think it applies really well. So we asked teachers, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, social workers, immigration solicitors, foster carers, and a range of other people, um, a series of questions using something called a Delphi study, which is it's a multi-round questionnaire where you refine what people have said and send it back to them. And the aim is to find consensus. So where people disagree, you basically cut it out. And where they agree, you try and refine it. And th there's some, we're, we're writing that work up at the minute. We've got a short report that I can link to, all of four pages. The findings really surprised us. So the one thing that everybody agreed on was the thing that got in their way and made their lives harder, made it impossible to really support these children. And don't forget this from a huge range of backgrounds, not just education was accommodation. So for these older learners, and of course for families and their younger children with them, nobody felt they could get traction until the kids were in a secure accommodation. And some of these children, their families, they've been moved every 28 days, whether that's to a different room in the same hotel or, or across the city or even across country. That instability in their lives made it very, very hard for, for any of these professionals to, to do their jobs. And that just comes back to, you know, how do we support all pupils? Well, just feeling safe and secure is the number one foundation, as with all children. We also 
ask questions about, you know, do, do you think that you're able to do a good job? Do you think that other people will be able to do a good job? When you, when you try to get hold of someone to ask a question, do you think that they'll answer, be able to answer? And, and the responses were, you know, overwhelmingly negative to those questions. But then we asked, do you have confidence in the other people you're working with across these many professional sectors? And the answer was, yeah, absolutely. And we said, what's the one thing that would make your life better? And they said, an opportunity to meet each other and to learn from each other. So people didn't necessarily want, for, for working with, with migrant refugee peoples, they didn't necessarily want training in their own area. Education is a bit of an outlier here, to be honest, but immigration solicitors know how to process immigration cases, for example. So they didn't necessarily want training in their own area, but they wanted to understand how other people work with these kids so they could do their job better. And that was... I felt really, really powerful that the message from, you know, if we go through education and, and through that whole sector, things can be really, really challenging at the moment, especially. But there is such an enormous depth of, of mutual trust and goodwill. Even if you know you don't trust someone to pick up the phone, people recognise that that's a system problem, not an individual problem. And we had this we had this launch event in September in in, in Bristol, and you know we we'd booked for a certain number, and that number and a half turned up. And it and it just it was such a fantastic atmosphere to to have all these people in a room together and people really lingered and and you know we we did put on a bar um <laughs> got, got got to know each other a little and so so this perhaps is something that that becomes really significant it just goes back to everything we've said about about those feelings of guilt and shame about the need to to give pupils a secure foundation before we build on it and so on that what we see in education is what we see across the sector for these pupils. And it just comes back to that, that fundamental, I guess, observation, belief, truism that people who go into teaching are, are basically very, very good people and um, who don't, who aren't always equipped with the knowledge and skills that they need to do the job they're trying to do. That's our failing as a, as a sector. It's not anyone's failing as a, as an individual. So then we think, right, well, okay, what do we need to do to change that? And my response to that is to say, well, I can't do your job. I don't think I could do it even if I tried, but I can do something that I think contributes to it. We need, we need new evidence. And, and part of my job, is, the research side of my job is to, is to contribute to that. But we also need to understand how it all fits together and how it can inform a series of principles or, or kind of evidence-based positions that people can base their professional judgment on. Because those experiences you described you didn't have that that strong foundation to base your judgment on and you you get all kind of uh, offline I'll, I'll share some of the stories but stuff people come up with just following a logical train to to the middle of nowhere um is really problematic but if you've got that strong grounding in knowing how children acquire language how it connects with their curriculum learning what they need if they come from certain backgrounds you very quickly, I think, get to a position where you, you can make really good judgments. And, and I would say, I mean, I've been doing this a while now. I meet very few people who believe they can make judgments as good as they can. So an awful lot of people say, I've got no idea. All I can tell you is, and then they tell you all this amazing stuff that, they, <laughs> that they've known that they do. And actually, I think you know, confidence might be a bit of an issue there as well. But but just, you know, for migrant refugee pupils, foundations are the same. It's a lot more complex for some of their lives. You, you probably would do well working with people across the sector. So understanding, you know, are they going to their immigration list or is their parents? Um, are they getting kind of mental health support from, from CAMS, from the NHS? Um, do they have secure accommodation? That kind of thing is really good to know because it helps you, helps you shape how you respond. But, but your educational response is going to be pretty much the same. Quite often you'll see in education people, there's a thing where, you know, there's a, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And so everyone says every book is absolutely wonderful. Everything's incredible, yada, yada, yada. I can genuinely say hand on heart that your book, Teaching AL Evidence-Based Strategies for the Classroom and School, is one of the best written, most accessible and most useful books I can imagine a teacher getting their hands on. Beyond your excellent book, are there any other resources that you would like direct teachers towards? I mean, you've already talked about the Bell Foundation, so it might be mm. just that. But are there beyond, say, your book, 
Bell Foundation. Is there anything else you would really, any other kind of websites, resources, whatever it might be that you'd really want uh, teachers yeah. and school leaders to know about? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, definitely buy my book. It's a, it's a <laughs> terrific book. I, I hope one day to make sell enough copies to be able to afford one myself. <laughs> so that that book was that book was written. I'll just speak about it a little bit because I think it, it was a bit of a labour of love. Um, it's in three parts. The first part talks about um, how language is required in in a school setting. And the second part talks about how they're used in the curriculum. And the third part talks about how you can put that into practice. So you can see it it, it very much reflects kind of my way of thinking about these things. I, I do hope that's useful. There's also, you know, I, I've got this personal bugbear about the kind of, and, you know, I, I do think the ones in your book, Chris, are rather good, but um, I, I've got this bugbear about people who, who are in books where you, you have these tasks um, at the end of a chapter that say, you've read this now reflect on how that works in your classroom how are you supposed to do that um and i i wrote a chapter years ago for a, one of these like big handbooks they use on teacher education programs and i wrote it and, and the editors came back and go oh, i've put the questions in for you I'm like, all right then you've read this now reflect on that you can't do that so the task there's about 14 or 15 i think the tasks i put in the book were things like right make a folder these are the things should go in it. If you haven't got them, go and talk to your head. You need these things. Like, how? Do, what's our policy on this? How do we do that? What do we know about this? Um, one of them says, make an appointment with your to see your line manager in two weeks' time. Right, this is how you spend that two weeks getting ready for it. And it sort of builds up from there. So it takes from someone who has just been appointed the EL coordinator. It's been maybe greatness has been thrust upon them. Um, and they have no idea where to start through to how you set up policies that work across groups of school or professional networks. So in terms of building up the skills, um, I, I did that because I, I didn't see anything between the kind of academic tomes in university libraries and top tips for Monday morning stuff you can get. I mean, some of this very, very useful. So it was it was written to, to bridge that gap. There's another book edited by Hamish Chalmers in the uh, the research ed series so it's a research ed guide to eal which is probably a little more leaning towards the scholarly side of things but it, it's got contributions from from practitioners as well as academics and i think that's really helpful it gives a kind of each chapter on so so my book is you know written by me so it, it it's my kind of my train of thought all the way through the edited book research ed guide to eal i think is really helpful because it, it gives you chaps on different topics you, you you get a different perspective there's not a huge amount out there uh, there's some i mean joe mcintyre's written a book on um, teaching refugee students but we're beginning to move away from our core kind of el constituency there so if i had to give people like a, a list of things to do i love a checklist i can't do anything if it's not my eye like or you know written in a checklist it's just not happening so obviously go and buy my book brilliant bring in a budding scheme if you're not sure, let's do the Hampshire MTAS Young Interpreter Scheme. Get a good assessment in place. So if you're not sure, download the Bill Foundation one. These are all free or remarkably low cost. Find some buddies because a lot of people will be very alone, actually. They're, they'll be the EL coordinator, but they don't really know anyone else. So lots of ways to do that. NALDIC, N-A-L-D-I-C, is the Subjects Association for EAL. They have an annual conference in November. Uh, membership is like 40 pounds a year so again for a, for a professional body it's, it's not huge um then you get the the el journal three times a year which is which is really good but you also i mean they run a series of regional groups um and special interest groups around the country i think that's 10 or 15 now um which you don't have to be a member at all to go to so um even if you don't want to join your association find out on their website where your nearest group is and and join in and they are are really good and ideally form a splinter group go off start another group and someone splinters off and you and we kind of propagate this stuff around the country twitter used to be great for eal and there's a couple of uh, a couple of groups that I'll, I'll dig out i've sort of quit social media now because i'm i think elon musk was the final straw for me it's just it's just stopped being so useful so there's caveats with with twitter x um it used to be a really great place to, to share ideas. There's an EL bilingual Google group that's got about 700 people on it. And that's perfect when you've got questions about how much extra time does this child get in this exam or things like that, really technical stuff. Someone always knows it on there. 
So I'd start with those as a, as a place and, and thinking about it, you want to get, get a little bit of your bookshelf to work through at your pace. You want to get some day-to-day -day tools so that you can do what you want to do, you know, and have the tools to do it. And then you want to get in the network and, and just make some buddies, make some people to go through with, go through it with. And, and that probably would be my starting point for recommended resources. Fantastic. I mean, and Chris is absolutely right. We, yeah, we actively don't take sponsorship or anything because we want our recommendations to mean something to people who are listening. So the, the, the Chris would speak so highly of the book does two things. I think it, it shows how much he, he cares about it. Um, but also makes me want to read it very, very soon. And so it might have to bump it up my, uh, my list. I mean, whenever Chris first wrote the idea of this episode, I remember searching and I think on possibly on your institution page, there are your, your greatest hits or perhaps your whole bibliography um, are sort of listed. And so, you know, you can tell by the titles that you're working in it, you know, and even by your response or your, some of your responses mm -hmm. earlier on, you know, some really powerful research that, that really matters. And, you know, you're talking about having that purpose at the start of the episode. I, I think that's totally there. And it, it has been an absolute pleasure to, to spend the evening with you talking about this and even just scratching the surface. Oh, it's been it's been great fun. I'm a I'm a big fan of the podcast. It's just you don't actually, you know, in my job and I'm, I'm maybe in yours too. You don't actually get to spend a lot of time with people who, who do care in the way you do about about some things that you do. And and actually, you know, you built a community of people who, who think deeply about primary education. And as the parent of of two primary age children. Um, it's given me a lot, a lot of new things to think about as I kind of watch it from that angle, but also as as an academic thinking, how can we, how can we make sure that bilingual children get the best shot? It's it's been a, a it's been a brilliant resource as I'm slowly working my way through the back catalogue. And yeah, and thank you from me as well. Um, it's it's just been such a pleasure to talk. You've wet the appetite with the idea of the um, the the resource that you are currently potentially putting together at your university relating to um, assessment and then follow-up actions. I'd love to have you back on the podcast if and when that comes into fruition, because I'm sure that would be um, incredibly useful to the profession. But yeah, thank you so much for your time. It really, um, it's really been fantastic to listen from you. Thank you. And everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>